I've enjoyed this opportunity to break bread with you once again. The professional relationship between those of us in public office and members of the press is an important ingredient of American freedom. Senator Moynihan once pointed out that countries which have papers filled with good news usually have jails filled with good people. Earlier this year, I suggested that perhaps, and it was a gentle suggestion, that perhaps the press could focus a bit more on the many wonderful things that Americans are doing for each other, especially during National Volunteer Week. There were a few cries of outrage, but now that the dust has settled, I think there's been a movement in the last few months to show the uplifting side of American life as well as our flaws. Of course, the imperfections need to be brought out, otherwise they might never be corrected. One of our greatest national treasures is our right as Americans to criticize government without fear of reprisal. There's a story about a Soviet citizen who was telling an American traveler that people in Russia are free to speak just like they are in the United States. The difference is that in the United States, they're free after they speak. Journalism is not an easy profession, especially when the events of the day are immersed in theories and schools of thought not familiar to an individual that's trying to meet a deadline. In the first two years of this administration, economic issues became the focus of news coverage as never before. We were making fundamental changes in the direction of this country, and it wasn't always easy to understand what was happening and why the changes were being made. Well, these changes take time before they can take hold. As you understand, the suggestion that economic freedom needs time to work isn't good copy after a few weeks. And it's a bit difficult to visualize for a news audience how bad things would be if certain changes hadn't taken place. For example, thanks to our program against inflation, a middle-income family today has $600 more in purchasing power than in 1980. Now, I think that's an important story, yet it's a hard one to present visually on a newscast. Since the beginning of the year, the expansion of the economy has been robust. America is beginning to move again after years of isolation and, or I should say, inflation and stagnation. I think that was a Freudian slip when I said isolation there. But yesterday, the stock market, as you know, hit a new all-time high. And I'm pleased to report that this morning we received more heartening news about the economy. The figures for second quarter economic growth in gross national product have been revised upward for the second time from 9.2% to 9.7%. And now it is estimated that economic activity in the third quarter is rising at an annual rate of 7%. Some of the foreign policy challenges we face are just as vexing as those concerning our economy, and they're just as difficult for journalists to cover. When we got to Washington, we were faced with an unrelenting buildup of armaments and military equipment in Central America. Much of this material is provided by the Soviets and their Cuban and Libyan allies. The American people, and even some journalists, are confused about what's happening in Central America. Was well, stated succinctly, we're trying, even amid the turmoil, to encourage democracy, to ensure economic development, and to engage in dialogue and listen to every idea that might put an end to the bloodshed and bring peace. What we cannot do is permit Soviet armed and Cuban trained insurgents to shoot their way into power simply because we're unwilling to provide those who believe in democratic government with the means to defend themselves. The Middle East is another area where America's role as peacemaker will require courage and commitment. The agreement reached yesterday with leaders of both parties in the Congress is a welcome step forward in our pursuit of peace in Lebanon. If approved by both houses, it'll send a signal to the world that America will continue to participate in the multinational force trying to help that nation back on its feet. We've informed the Congress that we have reservations about certain features of the resolution, and our agreement is subject to those reservations. But that should not obscure a fundamental point. This resolution, hammered out in long hours of discussion between the congressional and executive branches, represents a bipartisan commitment that America will continue to play a significant role 
in the search for peace in the Middle East. And it's on that, resol or that basis that I urge the Congress to act on this resolution quickly. Peace is our highest goal. We've been working tirelessly to achieve it through diplomacy. But our participation in the multinational force of U.S., French, Italian, and British troops is absolutely crucial if the fighting is to stop, the Soviet-sponsored aggression against Lebanon is to end, and the diplomats have a chance to succeed. I'm very pleased that many members of the Congress on both sides of the aisle recognize this reality and are willing to work with us in this pursuit. Three years ago, America was being counted out by friend and adversary alike. It was being said that our best days were behind us. Well, today we can be proud that where freedom is on the line, the United States is living up to its responsibilities, and we must not permit domestic politics to get in the way of these responsibilities. Ultimately, the answer to many of these problems will be found in better relations between the Soviet Union and the rest of the world. The massacre of 269 airline passengers has brought home to many just how difficult this will be. At an absolute minimum, the Soviets should give the world an apology, an admission of responsibility, pay reparations to the victims' families, and provide assurances that such a crime will never be repeated. For our part, we stand ready to work with the Soviet government to see that this kind of tragedy never happens again, and to deal on other vital issues such as arms reduction. After consultation with our allies, I have sent Ambassador Paul Nitze, our INF negotiator, instructions to pursue new U.S. initiatives with the Soviet negotiators in Geneva. On these or any of the other areas of concern, the time has come for the Soviets to show the world that they're serious about peace and goodwill. And that's enough of a statement from me. I know that you must have some questions. Well, just, uh, one, right, I'll get that near. No. Well, let me say this. In, in theory and in principle, yes, I do, because we ourselves have proposed a change in the antitrust laws with regard to a number of things such as research, things of that kind that industry in America for its own progress and for our country's progress should be allowed to do without being in violation of the antitrust laws. Now, I can't give you all the specifics on that, but we have introduced quite a package uh, for legislation on that subject. They might apply to the steel industry. Yes, because I would think that uh, that they are too. Uh, innovation and research is very much a part of uh, of the problems confronting them today. Well, we have to continue to try try to bring that about. And while there's a great deal of attention spent on whether we're shooting back or not shooting back when our Marines are in danger, we are in continuous uh, diplomatic uh, negotiations uh, by way of our ambassador there and by the two ambassadors that we sent, Fairbanks and McFarlane. Uh, they're back and forth between Damascus and, and Beirut uh, constantly to help bring this about. The mission that the multinational force was created for has not changed. At the time the first request came in, you'll remember that the Israelis were in, the Syrians were in, the PLO was in, and the fighting was going on, and hundreds and hundreds of innocent people were being killed in the shelling and bombing that was taking place. For several years, the government of Lebanon had been literally set aside by the factions in Lebanon, in which each one had its own militia. And the request came, and the multinational force went in with the idea 
of helping provide stability as the foreign forces withdrew and left Lebanon then to establish its government and establish its supremacy or sovereignty over its own territory. We have helped in the training of the Lebanese army. And I must say that while the Lebanese army has not been able to expand to the size to handle all the problems facing it, it is a well-trained and capable force. Everything was proceeding on schedule. Our negotiations in which we helped Lebanon and Israel come to an agreement. You remember at the time, Syria had promised that when everyone else got out, they too would get out. Then they changed their minds. Whatever reason, well, we can take our own guess at that. Uh, they've made it pretty apparent that they feel that they have a proprietorship over much of Lebanon. Uh, they, and I think under the influence of the Soviet forces that are there in their own country, are uh, behind much of what is presently going on. But the fact still remains the multinational force is there to help in this achieving of stability controlled by Lebanon. And I think the mission still goes on. But from the very first, I have said we will never send our men any place where they will not be allowed to defend themselves. They come under attack, and that recently has happened, and they have been defending themselves. But the efforts toward a ceasefire still go on, and the opposition to that is coming from Syrians and now from PLO, who have re-infiltrated after they were once taken out of the country and have moved into the fighting. And if this fails, the peace plan for the whole Middle East that we had proposed and offered our help in bringing about based on Camp David and the United Nations uh, resolutions that they had passed, I think also goes. And it's all of us must ask ourselves if we are not aware that the reason we were trying to promote a peace plan is that the Middle East is vital to the Western world. United States and to our allies. Oh, the young, the young lady there. How far will we let the Jamal government and the Lebanese army and its American prestige now completely in their success? Well, we can't, obviously, can't guarantee victory, but such things as this recent shelling and the controversy about whether that was in defense of the Marines was based on the commanders on the ground recognizing that if that particular vantage point in the hills was taken, it would make the position held by our Marines untenable because those who had been shooting at them would be looking right down their throats from those heights, very close. And uh, so we're convinced, and I hold that this was part of them defending the, themselves. But we're continuing, as I say, with the negotiations. And uh, I think there is, well, we still have reason to believe that we can attain that ceasefire. Yeah. Well, the idea was that we were, the multinational force was there to try and preserve order while the army then proceeded to take over and take over from uh, uh, those uh, militia factions in their own country. So uh, uh, I think that the mission that we're on is, is uh, still operative. <laughs> Well, the statement that I made was based, that agreement is not, you know, in the form of some formal treaty or agreement. This was a series of letters exchanged between President Kennedy and uh, the Castro regime. 
to our knowledge, they have not uh, brought back in nuclear weapons, which was part of it. We have felt, in a number of instances, the, the so-called agreement in this letter form is rather ambiguous on many points. I think what I was trying to say was that we believe that in spirit, certainly, uh, that has been abrogated. And yet, it's very hard to pin it down as you would with the treaty and say, you've broken the treaty. And uh, we, we tried to establish communications with Mr. Castro quite some time ago when he had indicated that perhaps uh, uh, this should be done. And we got no place. And as far as we're concerned, uh, uh, we are going to continue there and the Soviet efforts to establish another Cuba on our mainland in Central America, and we're going to do that as we have been doing in, in Central America. Now, you've asked a question that I really shouldn't answer. Uh, I don't see the necessity for the United States going to war in any place where we are. But as I once said in a press conference here, and uh, some of the regular White House press corps tried to hang me out to dry on it, uh, there are some things about which a president should never say never. Um, and I, I just think things of this kind. But there is nothing in our plans that envisions a war for the United States. Our job is trying to prevent war wherever it may come in the world. And uh, this is the reason for our military buildup and it's the reason for our uh, uh, meeting and disarmament talks more than any other administration has ever had going at one time in our history. So uh, I can just say that we're going to continue on this line and at any time that Castro, whose country is in dire straits, uh, is an economic basket case, any time that he wants to take, make the moves to return to the community of American nations here in the Western Hemisphere, uh, we'd be happy to sit down with him and work that out. But it begins with him coming out from under the wing of the Soviet Union. Now, wait a minute, I've got to go to the back of the room there, so there, there was one. Mr. Well, so far, we see no indication of anything of the kind there. Uh, you can't rule anything out when you're dealing with some of the kind of people that we're having to deal with in that episode. But I would think that they would do thinking two or three times more uh, before uh, they would attempt anything of that kind. Well, I asked at my table here a while ago if anyone has ever heard a 16-inch gun go off. The uh, New Jersey should be arriving very shortly. Uh, the same thing would apply to the fleet that applies to the Marines. They will defend themselves if attacked. You know, and we just thought that uh, you ought to get a look at the, joining the, up with the 6th Fleet for a while in the Mediterranean. Uh, Andy Miller, working in Boston. Uh, concerning the length of the resolution, the congressional resolution, Senator Kennedy is calling that quote a blank check for far too long a period. What do you think about the length of, of the uh, resolution and also that it puts it past the election? I think that the agreement has worked out. Both sides have some reservations. Uh, I'll be voicing mine. Uh, probably uh, at the time of signing, if it passes. I think the senator is absolutely wrong, 
And I think those people that have advocated uh, such things as invoking the 60-day clause are very short-sighted. Because if you did that, aren't you simply saying to the people who are causing the trouble now, step up the trouble for 60 days and your problems will be over, the multinational force will go home. 18 months gives us a long enough period of time uh, that um, uh, that doesn't hold true. And I would point out that the first person who ever voiced 18 months as a reasonable time was Speaker of the House, uh, Tip O'Neill. And uh, I was happy to agree with him. Oh, I think he was thinking out also that it, the same thing that I've just mentioned, that make it a long enough time that that does not become a factor in the strategizing of the people who are causing the trouble. Thank they, you, Mr. They, President. Tell me. Thank you. You do have an appointment. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I can understand his saying that if we deliberately bypass the Philippines at this point as part of the planned trip, there are no pl plans to change the trip uh, as of now. Uh, it, the whole Southeast Asian trip is planned and, uh, and uh, as far as we're concerned, is going ahead on schedule. Thank you, Mr. President. What? I think that the gentleman who spoke for us the other day, I'm three questions past that last question here. I'm, uh, I think some of the, the gentleman who spoke the other day uh, uh, had the hearty approval of most people in America in his suggestion that we weren't asking anyone to leave, but if they chose to leave, uh, goodbye. Um, Gene Kirkpatrick has made an interesting suggestion also that uh, should be thought about, that maybe uh, all of those delegates should have six months in the United Nations meetings in Moscow, and then six months in New York, and uh, it'd give them an opportunity to see two ways of life. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. And we'd permit them Thank if they wanted to. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much for being here. Please remain in your places till the President leaves. One second, let me get him out here. 